thank you and welcome back so today we will continue our discussion on communism capitalism and the search for identity in our last session we discussed how communism uh, capitalism basically focuses on opportunity and individuality but it leads often to inequality because successful people wealthy people go on top and others get exploited in capitalism uh, in communism they try to impose equality but eventually it leads to uh, people developing lethargy on one side and on the other side the the eventually equality is created because there are two uh, there are people who are rulers and they become they can become brutally powerful so underlying both of these the common problem we could say is that there is human nature there's a human nature has its weaknesses because of which human nature people might become lethargic people might become exploitative people might become domineering so common to capital capitalism and communism respective of the differences is both see success in material terms that we provide uh, uh, we provide material goods to people and both to some extent see the human being as a as a material creature who is meant for consumption and uh, production and consumption so then we discussed about how if we want to grow uh, if we if spirituality is to provide some answers one aspect of it is to understand that there is uh, that the resources of the world which we are trying to use and and make something worthwhile they don't belong to us they belong to god another aspect of it is that the human being is a spiritual being and and that's why providing material things alone will not satisfy people so if we consider that the fundamental problem in society is not an economic problem but a spiritual problem that spiritual problem is that human nature needs to be needs to be addressed and remedied or rectified so that humans don't succumb to exploitation exploitative mentality or lethargy or whatever so how would spiritual wisdom help us at a social level to address the fundamental problem of human nature so is this a more or less reasonable summary of what we discussed last time yeah and uh, i would also like to see whether 50 years of iskon of course iskon should not be seen just in the light of the last 50 years our existence can be traced back to the medieval ages and also even back to prehistorical times yeah if 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 somebody can give us that uh, bandwidth so to say so in that sense what have we contributed what we could do and in one way also where we have not succeeded and as uh, members of our institution we remain loyal to its tenets and principles but also we are in proper words supposed to be independently thoughtful mm. so i'm not taking the course of being independent minded and uh, this much thinking on authorities or powers to be or those who are in charge uh, as they say people get the government they deserve so similarly we also have a little bit of that uh, we need to take care of that so where is the rfi where is the room for improvement for a society like iskon where we know the four different uh, tasks being an intellectual being an administrative person being a productive person or being a tertiary sector person they are predominantly meant to be active in the intellectual department mm. so whether we can whether we have done something that is laudable or where we need to do something more that should be explored that would be my end of today hmm so if we consider the four varnas that were there 
in traditional Indian culture, they are also talked about in the Bhagavad Gita. They are all meant to help people both have a meaningful, uh, productive social engagement and also to help increase, to help them develop a spiritual connection. The idea that Bhagavad Gita says is Yetaha pravrtir bhutanam yena saram vidam tatam swakarmanatam abhyarcha siddhim mindati manava that in 1845 says that uh, the 1846 it says that swakarmanatam abhyarcha by your work worship and swakarmana krishna is telling before that the four varanas so the idea was worship the lord through your work and uh, the original system was meant so that people according to their nature they contribute to society and they also connect with the lord and thus they grow spiritually and they grow materially according to their capacity so if we consider this system ideally as it was present uh, at then the concept was that people are different we cannot impose equality artificially on humanity because different people have different abilities. So acknowledge the diversity, but we so at, we have diversity at a material level. We have we acknowledge equality at a spiritual level. That is, everybody is a soul who is meant to go toward the Lord, who is going to grow spiritually, find inner fulfillment. But everybody will have to do it in their own way to some extent. So now, when uh, that was a system, to some extent, it's a question whether that system is the sole way to spiritual growth or is that system something which is practiced in the past and because that, that particular social structure is not seen today as viable, can spiritual growth be sought by individuals independent of or in whatever context they are? So one could be the understanding of Varanashram, if you use those words, is that we, we have society, people divided according to their, uh, people uh, divided is a dangerous word to some extent today, classified according to their natures and engaged. But another way of looking at Varanashram could be that the essential principle is people, people find a material setting that is compatible for them and they function within that material setting which is also compatible for their spiritual growth. So basically care for the material needs in a way that is spiritually conducive. So, for example, today, if somebody is a writer or somebody is a singer, somebody is a doctor, then if they could do their professions in a way that is broadly spiritually compatible, that would that be addressing that underlying essential principle? So everybody has to do some job and they contribute accordingly. But the idea is we also need to address the fundamental flaws of human nature which can sabotage even the best of systems. So the spiritual connection is what addresses the human nature by, by purification and the, whatever the current material nature is, that is channeled through appropriate engagement and contribution. So if we could see that as the essential purpose, then we can look at how uh, the, the current expression of the tradition in the form of the Krishna consciousness movement has contributed or can has performed or can perform in today's world. Does that make sense to you? Yeah, I, I would like to address that thing where you said uh, with a little bit of trepidation that can I use the word divide society? I have to make a confession here. The first time I read Srila Prabhupada saying divide society it sent a shock wave through my spine. I felt a cold chill going down. And I said, divide? Why divide? And I remember, without understanding the whole thing, I had not read Janma Karma 
गुणकर्म विभाग you are joining a society which is intent on dividing society why as such do we have uh, less reasons for dividing society that you want to add one more it could be because the way the choice of words was made and uh, of course it takes some time to understand how to organize society so what prabhupad meant was organize things in a proper way i'll give an example which may not be like completely suitable but in our own temple establishment there was a fire in the restaurant in our restaurant somebody noticed it they raised an alarm fire 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 within 2 minutes we could see the flames leaping from the kitchen and there were about 8 or 10 people just panicky somebody is telling what exactly is the nature first of all see whether it's a chemical fire paper fire electrical fire or what else there is a simple unassuming devotee he was standing there and he didn't have the courage to speak loudly so he told someone i am from the navy i have a 3 month certificate course uh, i am a certificate uh, holder in fire management so then somebody else who was more like a administrative type he shouted everybody just shut up and come down and let this guy go up So there was a vantage point where he stood up. He could see that there is a gas connection is on fire, and the vent, uh, the steam vent, the inner linings get coated with grease. That's on fire. Within seconds, he could understand what's to be done, and he politely told that these four people should not be, although they were part of the restaurant establishment, they should not be allowed here. And then he said, four people just give me sand. to give me water to stand here didn't he divide the whole motley crowd into a orderly kind of thing those whom he thought were useful he kept them others who could not understand he just tell that all that at least don't do any any mystery just just stay there so in one sense he divided society one sense he organized it why because he was the best intellectual response we could have for that particular event now of course society doesn't go through emergencies all the time when there's a emergency mostly people agree and i can say it with confidence because we are seeing 1.3 billion people actually agreeing to just one guy telling them believe me things will improve if we have a lockdown so that's what an intellectual does that he can prove on the basis of uh he or she can prove on the basis of having that maturity and there are certain certain uh, guidelines there are certain indicators as to what will make people believe but we won't go into that so i will end with this point i have a management background and i have also involved in reading a lot about training process so the western mindset immediately either it has a it recoils that uh, oh india ancient india social system caste system we don't want we, we are not interested as early as 1950 two ladies they developed the myers briggs type indicator hmm what was that for 
because the industrial revolution could be seen as going at its peak in the 1840s 1850s or so and then uh, india became independent in 1950 and then 47 so railways came to india in 1950 so india was slow to industrialization so by the time it was 1950 uh, 1960 rather, 18, i think 1850 you're saying 1850 the railways came to uh, no no oh the indian war of independence began in 1857 and uh, railways came to india maybe 1870 or something like that 1880 because the railways celebrated their 125th uh, some kind of thing wasn't that okay well, okay no no so so what i'm saying is india was late to be industrialized yeah the the division was very clear they this when when i said economics it was developed countries and underdeveloped countries hmm. and then to be more politically correct they started saying developing countries yeah so that was like a little solace for our hurt minds that well I, why was i born in a developing country why couldn't i be born in a dev- developed country that is the whole thing and our generation or even one generation before us completely brainwashed as to uh, you are less you are less you are less a few days ago when i was trying to just come in when i was trying to do some research on this thing now this is from the 1950s and uh, this is done by well what does it say it was uh, well the year is not set uh, this right here but trying to divide people into introverts extroverts sensory or intuitive thinking feeling judging and perception now this is as close afterwards there are many tests and right now if you check on the net you will have some people saying that mbti doesn't work some say it works some say it we we need something but the idea is if you have someone who is more of a intuitive and a thinking person there are certain jobs for example being an accountant this person is more suitable if somebody is a extrovert person there are certain jobs like sales or marketing which are more suitable now there are exceptions where somebody like there were hollywood heroes who would be completely introverts off the stage they would be publicity shy they would not like people but on stage they would take that persona exceptions will always be there so i would make a defense of the the guna karma vibhaga sha thing that if the birth criteria is taken away is there any harm in trying to understand the personality traits through which we can engage a person in a particular occupation yeah actually it is very a thoughtful uh analysis of the point that we all need some aids to find our place and purpose in the world yes and uh, so if we consider the principle that's perfectly not only valid but we could say it's valuable because if somebody understand say okay i am an introvert and that's why i don't i don't feel comfortable in crowds otherwise people start thinking you are socially inhibited you are a strange person why do you stay alone well no this is the way i am and uh, it it can be actually very empowering to understand that so then if we consider these person this the any system of analysis of again going back to human nature or human personality the purpose is that we recognize our strengths we recognize our limitations and then we function optimally accordingly 
and when you function optimally the idea is that we contribute at a practical level at a social level and at the same time we also do something which is meaningful and we grow spiritually so if we are to address that spirituality is basically meant to improve or enrich or enhance human nature then it could almost be said that this can be applied to any system of social classification say so an in, a person who is an introvert and a person who is extrovert both can practice bhakti but both there may be some significant differences in the stress in how they practice bhakti if a person is say type a or type b as we call talk about leaders so they may all practice it in different ways and everybody at whatever level they are they can they can grow spiritually and they can grow in their grow professionally or grow socially also if they understand themselves better and they tap themselves better so if uh, so am i with you or are the two of us yes 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 okay we 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 could be touching disjoint uh, corners but i hope that we converge at one point later in the conversation you made a point which immediately triggered off a thought in my head that let us say somebody is having a particular occupation which gives him a lot of money hmm so today things are judged on mostly in the outside world take it or i mean hate it or love it on the basis of how much money you have earned so there is a lot of money coming in but there is no inner satisfaction on the other hand someone chooses to do what he or she likes to do and then there is no money coming in hmm so one particular group of people who choose their vocation depending upon what they like they are seen as losers and they may also seen themselves as misfits while somebody who does something which the world can throw its money at gets a truck load of cash but inside he is cringing he is dying a miserable death every day so net result is dissatisfaction so can our efforts at keeping spirituality at the center keeping spiritual goals as the main goals in life can they address this particular issue yes that's a it's a important question if we at one level let's talk about in the bhagavad gita krishna talks about within our inner world in our world there are three things there's the body there's the mind and there's the soul so at the mm-hmm. level of the mind krishna talks about two distinct kinds of impressions uh, i prefer to use the words impulses and instincts for them okay but we can we can use some other words but so impulses i correlate with lust anger greed envy pride illusion and instincts i correlate with innate abilities So you call somebody, them the first negative and the ne- other positive like that yeah some yeah, impu- okay. yeah impulses are anti intelligent okay whereas instincts are programmed intelligence so somebody who is he has musical instincts they don't have to laboriously practice to get the basics they just get it and even new they learn fast of course everybody has to practice but they have some innate ability in it so when Krish- krishna at one level tells arjuna that you have to curb you know jahi shatrum mahabaho you have to curb lust curb desires but at the same time the same krishna is saying nigraha kim karishyasi mm. what will repression accomplish so the way i see it is as far as the instincts are concerned arjuna has kshatriya instincts you have to rep- you cannot repress them you will have to act according to your kshatriya nature but krishna is telling a kshatriya can become power hungry a kshatriya can become greedy a kshatriya can become violent unnecessarily a kshatriya can become lusty so for that you have to you have to discipline it so the so the impulses 
have to be curbed and the instincts have to be channeled beautiful so why i was saying this is that if uh, we understand ourselves as spiritual beings then there is a that self understanding itself creates a certain amount of distance and detachment from worldly propaganda and worldly gains so rather than thinking i just want to i want to make the most money i want to make the most i want to have the most followers once somebody understands their nature then i said i am a soul then if i am a soul let me try to understand what kind of body i have right now what kind of instincts i have and then let me work accordingly so rather than just simply chasing after the professions that are socially glamorized or that are lucrative in the current socio economic structure the capacity to choose something that is more meaningful and fulfilling for oneself that capacity is developed by spiritual self understanding because if i have a material self understanding then i will also have a material definition of success and the material definition of success will be you know how much money i get how much uh, prestige and po- power and positions and possessions i get and certain professions may give them more certain professions may give them less so if we consider the brahmanas and kshatriyas the brahmanas don't get any property much pro- uh, they don't get much possessions so but they are ready to accept that the kshatriyas get certain things and they accept that but then along with that they have they have to ready to fight wars and there are dangers over there so in one sense spiritual self understanding can actually enhance material self understanding also and once a person is materially satisfied to some extent then uh, curbing the curbing the impulses becomes easier if if i am working in a profession which I, if i am working at a job that i love to do then i get some satisfaction in that and then therefore i i can more easily resist the lure of greed i can more easily resist the lure of lust or anger because basically if i am unsatisfied where i am that's where lust anger greed all of these start tempting and troubling us so what could be a starting point for someone someone says okay i'll buy your message that i need to find that exact spot where i should stand so do you guys have any kind of a uh, like a road map towards understanding your spiritual nature we always claim we do but can we translate that into a cogent legible road map are you talking about spiritual nature or material nature yeah you said understand your spiritual nature and you fortify yourself against so many of the mental problems which people face today so in okay. this half capitalist half communistic or completely confused half capital half communistic but totally confused state today what can the <laughs> hari krishna movement <laughs> suggest okay. to person Hmm. Probably, it's a grassroots level change because uh, we live in a world where, because it's a secular world, it's going to be difficult for any wisdom tradition, which is reflexively associated with some religion. to present itself on the broader socio political context so at this stage it's it might be best for us to work at an individual level and uh, now if you look at say religious history christians were persecuted by the roman empire uh, in fact it was a roman official who crucified jesus and then after that for several centuries 
it was uh, Christ Christians who were persecuted quite a bit. And after that, as the Roman Empire started crumbling, not so much because of external attacks, but because of inner immorality, the king started looking around and seeing who are the moral people, who are the responsible people. And he found that they were Christians. And then he decided that even for, function, for any functioning society, a basic level of morality is required. And does he, he adopted Christianity as the official religion of the Roman Empire in the hope that citizens would become moral by that. Now, of course, that had led to certain complications because he adopted, a religion, he adopted Christianity not for spiritual growth, but for political consolidation. And does he adjusted some doctrines and he, he rejected the idea of any future lives. But the point is that it is thereby, by, by being constructive members in society up to, a particular point, uh, up to a particular point, that's when they attracted the attention of the government. So we could work at an individual level and if individually those who have, those who do some spiritual practices and therefore are spiritually grounded, hmm, they are also materially competent, they are materially responsible, and they are material, they are moral. Then every organization needs people who are competent and responsible. And do we have models? Now this is bit, uh, I'm I'm proposing an answer, but I'm also uh, questioning the answer simultaneously. So if we consider this principle. Does it happen that by the practice of Bhakti Yoga or the Gita's wisdom, do we see individuals being transformed, the human nature being addressed or being improved and thereby people becoming better contributors to society? If you are asking me, the answer is uh at least to my experience a big yes may not be yes with y e s capital at okay. least the y is capital yeah. so so in one sense uh, a spiritual model is also a little bit of self critical so yes. trying to say that we have saved the world or we have we are the great benefactors of society is a bit kind of a uh, thing which would derail my own internal process. I would not like to be seen like that. I would rather like society to say that uh, this person or this particular has contributed in a much bigger way. So I was just thinking in today's times, when people are in self-isolation and they are uh, practicing social distancing, if we try to fortify people's minds and we show good examples, like many times, like uh, I really appreciate this saying that by like one preacher told his deputy, by all means preach. And if necessary, open your mouth. Mm. So, so when we talk of satisfied people, when we talk of people who are uh, like they have found their bearing, they know exactly this is what I'm meant to be. And this is what uh, I, I, I don't need to do. This could very well be a, like a silent example. And when the world kind of depends upon YouTube likes and Facebook friends. We may not find such uh, happy contented people. Those who are putting videos every day, because that would be against their nature. It would take something more than that to find out. But at the same time, when you nicely put it that 
you should begin with an understanding that we are spiritual by nature. So now that we are discussing and appreciating Chila Prabhupada's genius in calling the process of chanting the Hare Krishna Maha Mantra as part of a cultural process. In the very first seminal essay he put out, he said, there is no need of any mental adjustment. There is no need to understand the language of the mantra. So I feel that this is the this is the understanding that here you are you are confused. In fact, if somebody knows he's confused, he's already leagues ahead of 90% of the population. At least he knows that he's confused. Many don't know that they are confused. Many don't know that. Yeah. <laughs> so, so, so in that sense, if people follow Srila Prabhupada's uh, offering of this simple sound vibration, and he says that it will surpass physical, mental, and intellectual levels. Now, for that, we have empirical evidence that simple physical comfort and luxuries do not amount to satisfaction. There is enough of evidence for that. Hmm. People with all kinds of things which they can satisfy uh, their mind, they feel that music, song, dance, entertainment is not able to give them mental satisfaction also. So when so I am I'm going to take this to this level where we may not have empirical evidence about the kind of satisfaction which spiritual culture gives, but we do have empirical evidence that of the dissatisfaction created by putting our priorities in a wrong way. Hmm. Yes. So taking this forward that... Yeah. If we consider that the spiritual practices like chanting the holy names, they give us some kind of non-material enrichment. Sure. So it, uh, there is, uh, there are, there are spiritual signs of spiritual advancement, spiritual parameters of spiritual advancement. We could say. Mm -hmm. Now, can they be translated? or appreciated in the terms of social contribution. Say, for example, like earlier I said, the greed and the hunger for power among the leaders of society that can sabotage any system. Or if in communism, if people become lethargic, that can sabotage a system. So if we consider the impulses, the self-destructive self impulses or the world destructive impulses, lust, anger, greed, envy, pride, illusion. Now, we have certain parameters that these decrease by spiritual practices. Say, for example, somebody who is a spiritual practitioner may not, may, will not maybe take alcohol, will avoid intoxication, will avoid gambling. Now, will, can we say that these are avoiding these activities contributes to helping them become better citizens. And it's not just these activities, it's what these activities represent. So that means uh, the we have four principles, four regulative principles we talk about, the no meat eating, gambling, intoxication, illicit sex, and they are associated with certain virtues. And these are considered the four pillars of dharma. So that is uh, meat eating is we avoid meat eating and then we show mercy, isn't it? Then intoxication is gambling is truthfulness. Avoid gambling and we cultivate truthfulness. Then avoid uh, illicit sex and we create cultivate purity. Yes, cleanliness. Cleanliness and we avoid austerities for intoxication. Intoxication. Okay, so now. Would a person who is austere, merciful, uh, clean or pure, we could say pure hearted and uh, truthful, 
would such a person be a more valuable asset for society for a contributing better in society are these these virtues uh, translatable or can be assessed as valuable in social terms uh see in and of themselves these four are in one sense neutral it's like like uh, take a nation there is someone who is a uh, a person who is a citizen who is aware of his civic responsibilities higher than that is a patriot who says i love my country i would sacrifice something for my country hmm below that could be a saboteur a traitor who may sell sensitive information to an enemy so certainly somebody who is a traitor they say traitors hang so hmm. they need to be punished but if you are following these four regular principles and if you kind of this is a part of your spiritual cv so it's like saying Uh, why should i hire you for this job sir i haven't committed any murder in my last 23 years <laughs> oh god i haven't raped anyone there are no uh, what is slander felony charges against me so they may say but sir it's not expected if you are aspiring for this high job here then tell us about the positive things which you have done so in one sense these four are like a fence the fence means it is supposed to protect something so what is it that it is protecting hmm. so this is a criticism leveled against many indian governments in the past may not be now or could be now also that they say we will have a tree planting campaign 3 billion trees planted so mostly they have a small hole in the ground with a small round fence and after 3 or 4 months you find that the thing inside the fence is intact but what is it it is it is protecting so sorry after 3 months what happens there is nothing inside there is no sapling the sapling is dead ah oh, okay so what is it that it, it is protecting so the four regular principles the four positive attributes they are the protectors of your spiritual sapling the spiritual culture and that okay. sapling when it grows into a big tree then you may not need the small fence around okay so these rules and regulations are not meant to be a kind of a deciding factor through and through <laughs> of course i'm not saying it gives a license that after some time of spiritual progress you may break them i'm not insinuating that at all but the fact is that they are meant to protect something and that something is what you began with that understanding our our innate spiritual nature developing it then in one sense it doesn't matter what you are doing outwardly to preserve your body and soul together you could be as just an english a tinker tailor soldier sailor whatever and the the spiritual pursuit gives you so much of satisfaction so much of contentment that what comes from your job i would dare say in a bit of a adventurous mode is a insignificant by product hmm but if it is a insignificant by product then wouldn't that make people materially the, apathetic the media and... provides or the things which yeah would it make people materially apathetic or uncaring and not enterprising enough to contribute anything to society if we start feeling that it is insignificant like we mentioned you mentioned is four things now can you see the correlation between these four things and the industries that they represent today there is a big correlation 
So okay. today, the meat packing so today, industry, the gambling yeah, industry. Exactly. So today, Alcohol when they are saying, let us be more kind to animals. What do you mean more kind? Okay, let's not slaughter them mercilessly by the billions which we are doing. Hmm. Now, isn't this part of the education or training which a spiritually sound culture can give to people? That just because you can, you don't do these things. Maybe your previous generations did. Maybe your country or your culture has a long, long history of doing it. Like people always say, we are always uh, eating flesh. But for the last hundred generations, were your people eating in factory flesh with industry that would put Auschwitz to shame, that kind of incarceration of animals, that certainly was not there. Yeah, so that's not part of, even if we admit that people should be allowed to choose what food they want, whether it is animal food or plant-based food, even if it is animal-based food, what is happening now is certainly very shameful. Hmm. Just today I was reading about how when animals are, an animal husbandry or factory farms happen, so with respect to mammals, like cows, they have an apparatus which was earlier called as uh, the rape rack. Oh. And what was done at that time is all the limbs of the cow are tied up and then the seminal material from a bull is taken and then uh, a human hand is inserted into the reproductive organ of the cow and with an injection and the stuff is injected. And the whole idea of this is that if they, if they have to have natural union between a cow and a bull, they have to maintain a bull and bulls don't give milk. So it's just a unnecessary expenditure from other times. Just keep it made and then accelerate the insemination because the bull and the cow may not unite immediately, but do it faster. So of course now they, now they uh, call it, they, they renamed it, not like a, the rape rack, but the reproductive rack or something like that. It's a more softer name, but it's, so we could say at one level that uh, cruelty is a problem for any society and if cruelty is decreased the quality of the society will improve if yes. kindness and compassion are improved the quality of the society would improve so then this brings us to something that uh, it's it's a matter of the cultivation of virtues so spir spiritual culture and spiritual growth if it enhances virtues in people Virtues can contribute even to the material welfare. And without virtues, one cannot have any lasting material welfare. So whatever be the, whatever be the socio political, socio economic system in the world, if it is run by people with virtues, then that can uh, make sure that the system works well. Even if we have capitalism, but if the capitalists are not just uh, mad for money, they have a sense of social responsibility. They give charity. They take care. They uh, they take care of the welfare of people. Then that virtue of charity and absence of abs so we could say the the virtue of charity is present and the vice of greed is absent. Then. Uh, they could help create a better, uh, better society. Exactly. So, like one lady, this is a small example. A lady, a friend told me that his housemaid called up and said, I would like to come as soon as possible. And they stay in a suburb of Mumbai. And the friend called her and said, you want to come? Why? She said, uh, I'm actually bored at home and uh, I need to do something. I just can't sit all day. 
so he said that uh, well the danger of uh, covid spreading is not yet gone and then she actually blurted out that actually if i come to work at least you will be motivated to give me something because i haven't come for 35 straight days so he said listen even if you come don't come for two more months i am going to send you your monthly salary online do not worry so here is now he's not a big industrialist but he is doing his bit there is another doctor who is a dentist and she has uh, a dentist assisting her and three other employees same thing just because there is the closure doesn't mean i am i know that you your home may have some kind of a need is there a medical need or whatever so your salary is not going to be blocked do not worry about it so when krishna says yagya dana tapa kriya pavanani manishina you should not give up these things because they even purify people who are highly practiced or expert in the thinking thought uh, thinking process this is where i feel is the uh, maybe albeit small but a microcosm of the spiritual culture working is it not beautiful so this goes back again to the point of grassroots transformation that i had made earlier yes that that spiritual if spirituality infuses virtue in people then some people um, may have the resources to exercise that virtue in a small way say like a person with uh, with say middle class or upper middle class can give charity to maybe a few people but somebody who is a business tycoon they might be able to give charity to a large number of people so so society will arrange itself in some kind of hierarchy it might be communist it might be capitalist it might be it might be autocratic but what if, uh, like you started when you talk about the fire incident of the fire uh, there has to be a hierarchy for effective functioning so the every hierarchy we could say could can tilt toward ty tyranny yes but we can't assume by default that hierarchy is tyranny hierarchy is required and society may have its own current hierarchy and it can have its problems so capitalism can have its problems communism can have its problems the the way the varnashram got converted or degenerated into the caste system that hierarchy had its problems so we could critique each of these uh, systems in their own way but the important thing is no system will work if there are not individuals with virtues and the primary role of spirituality is to help the human being cultivate virtues or nourish virtues to combat vices and to cultivate virtues now we are talking about virtues not in a moralistic judgmental kind of sense but even for functioning in the world some amount of virtue is required In, uh, now we have this whole system of digital or rather online sale and purchase there is a certain amount of virtue honesty trust that is involved now like somebody bought something on on uh, when this started what was that uh, before amazon came up there was uh, on they call it craig's list in america yeah it's still there it's still there so if somebody bought something from there now a seller could a buyer could send money and if the seller doesn't send the product or the seller sends a defective product now who is actually going to litigate where is that seller how am i going to litigate i am going to do a court case uh, what am i going to do but there there is there is a basic level of trust is a basic level of competence and that system worked so so for any system to work there has to be some basic level of trust and competence and that is also associated with some basic virtues 
so if we consider the fact that spirituality can help people not uh, not that we in a moralistic sense but by tapping their own spiritual core they manifest their own virtue the virtues that are latent within them then that can lead to a, a inside out bottom up kind of transformation inside yeah. out within the individual bottom up in society and in that sense our spiritual contribution can be independent of the socio economic system that is there or what will model is outside what we are pursuing could be like independent of whatever that model is yes yeah correct and uh, could this be the reason that some some of our most prominent spiritual stalwarts ramanujacharya madhvacharya shankaracharya shri chaitanya mahaprabhu they did not pursue the socio economic paradigm prevalent during this during their times but encourage their followers to begin their the inward process of discovery as early and accelerated as much as possible can we say like that can you can you repeat last part accelerate accelerate the inward spiritual discovery process okay rather than wait for the socio economic paradigm surrounding them to become favorable yes i it has it has always been a intriguing feature for me that <laughs> although we could say at that time india was ruled by by fanatical rulers but our spiritual leaders are not really focused on talking anything about overthrowing the political leaders and uh, uh, but they have focused on it's at one level it's not just inward growth inward spiritual growth it was inward but there is also a significant amount of social reform in terms of challenging the 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 caste discriminatory caste system oh yes that so, that, that we have to agree so that means when, it, when it comes to when it comes activism to delivering a blow on say the solar plexus they have done it you know in, in the <laughs> Oh God! Yeah. So then, this could be a interesting question that did they cons in English? There is a saying that I think politics is downstream from culture. Okay. So that means where the culture, the way the culture is, politics will be shaped accordingly. So rather right. than trying to change the politics, change the culture. The politics will change gradually, like that. so <clears throat> um we see that our spiritual teachers did not uh, prominent spiritual teachers they did not try to change the politics political arrangement in the country in the area where they were but they did try to change the culture so the it could be that they felt cultural change could be more lasting political change uh, political things will keep going but cultural change will be more enduring what are your thoughts about that yes true agree so in today's world if we consider the present society we see that there are certain countries which are still somewhat communist and there are most of the world is going towards capitalism is somehow considered a, by many people to be like a dirty word capitalism is a terrible thing but the but the broadly the free market liberal liberal economy kind of thing so we see that the countries which are capitalist is the countries where there is at least an opportunity to practice spirituality so there could be political suppression of spirituality say as it was in 
Soviet Russia, or as it is even now to some extent in China. And there could be cultural distraction from spirituality, as may happen because of the excessive materialism or the explicit sensuality of much of Western culture. Now, among these two, at least there is an option to practice spirituality for those who want in the Western world. But in the communist rule, that option itself was could be trying to exercise that option could mean the death of, could mean death. There's a lot of persecution. There is persecution here in the communist countries and there are weapons of mass distraction. Yeah. Of the consumerist culture. <laughs> yeah, it's weapons of mass distraction. It's uh, in some ways, both of us have spent some time in the West now. I, you know, we often in India say it is Westernization, which is taking Indians away from their spiritual roots. It is making them more uh, non-religious or irreligious also. Uh, now, if we consider Western culture itself or in the Western world, is it the is it something innate to Western culture that is keeping Western people away from spirituality? Means Westernization is like the normal thing in the Western world. But we also see that America is considered to be one of the most religious countries in the first world. There are a significant number of Christians, uh, evangelical Christians and others. So is it... Uh, is westernization innately against spirituality? Because if we consider westernization, there is Europe and there is America. And Europe is much more atheistic, quite aggressively atheistic. America, in some ways, is materially more successful, or at least we don't know how it will happen after the current corona crisis ends, what will be the world economic order. But America is more materially, uh, materially uh, prosperous, and yet America is more religious than Europe. So is, when we say westernization, of, westernization leads to uh, deterioration of spiritual culture, uh, what is, is that true in the Western world? And why the diversity in Europe and America? So I'm trying to explore by this. What causes uh, someone to be spiritually receptive and to be not spiritually receptive? Any thoughts on this? Well, in one way, the mass consumerism which began after the Second World War, certainly there were waiting lines for people to join monasteries and abbeys, say from 1948 to 54 or something. And then the 60s was the Flower generation, hippiedom, people exploring alternate ways of lifestyle, meditation, LSD. And in a very, very curious way, we, we see, uh, I mean, and a very, very interesting thing happened when Soviet Union collapsed. There was a big surge in religion. People wanted to discover what is exactly that the government doesn't want me to read and why. Hmm. So their problem was the government didn't trust them and therefore they disliked okay. it intensely. So I, I follow one thing and I try to follow it scrupulously that whenever Prabhupada would say, just like in the West, as I'm seeing here, things are bad. Invariably he would add, why only in the West, even in India? So just westernization is not tantamount to uh, degradation of spiritual culture. But what Prabhupada meant was the culture which is based on sense gratification without any understanding of God. There are times when he, of course, he was preaching in America. So he would say that uh, you accept this spiritual culture 
and you will become the best nation in the world you are already you already are leaders the idea of democracy the idea of market based uh, uh, social structure is something which you already have contributed and the world sees the world tries to uh, emulate you to imitate all the time but also emulate so why don't you give a proper example by accepting this pure spiritual culture also he would exhort his audience all the time again and again and again so prabhupad you are saying also recognized the positives of western culture it was not just a uh, utilizing of the glamour associated western culture to to say remind indians of of its spiritual roots but um, were there were some things which uh, prabhupad appreciated about the west also is that what you're trying to say or means what are you trying to how are you correlating this example with my question so i think this is uh, these discussions are more we could say exploratory than ex uh, they are more of exploration than exposition yes we are we are ourselves trying to grapple social issues and uh, so i list uh, maybe we will just address this issue and we'll okay, we'll wrap it up that okay so you. you were saying that prabhupad appreciate western culture enough to recognize that it has a place of prominence in today's world very much and uh, that place of prominence could be utilized to help people appreciate spiritual values now in some ways when prabhupad encountered the west he encountered uh not so much the western culture as more of the western counter culture so when prabhupad made certain statements like uh, in he say for example in the west in the west there is no culture or you people sometimes he said you people have no culture it was more a statement about the way some of the hippies who were coming to the movement were living rather than a complete condemnation of what was there in the west because there are other places where see prabhupad did appreciate um, aspects about say i think the cleanliness the organization those are things which prabhupad appreciate and prabhupad's famous metaphor of uh the blind man and the lame man also indicates that there is certain things which could be appreciated that there are the capacity to organize material resources effectively so he said the material resources from the west and the spiritual wisdom from the east they combine together so it's not just wealth but it's also material organization that produces that wealth Don't you, think, don't you think prabhupad accepting the model of a governing body is his acknowledgement of the organizational acumen of the west so he may not have said directly in appreciation but that's true in order for the longevity of his movement he chose one particular aspect of western management that is an organized body of a committee of individuals and uh, he established it way way back even when his uh, society was not fully mature in fact just 5 or 6 years in existence and he thought this is the right time for me to train people up that and he true. gave them such heavy responsibilities calling them the ultimate managing authority hmm in fact once when it didn't function properly he had the whole thing resign everybody resign so that was a displeasure at the way in which they were functioning not at their existence yes because very soon he again reinstated it that's true now interestingly i read one book where he said that uh, prabhupad was 
doctrinally or philosophically orthodox but was institutionally quite innovative quite resourceful oh yes <laughs> and in fact i heard another way that the governing body commission that name either prabhupada or bhakti sanat thakur got from the managing body of the indian railways yes that was bhakti sanat thakur he took it from the indian railways he also had the he also wanted that name governing body commission only for his yes yes for his disciples so, to form a body explains that my guru maharaj wanted it he was about to establish okay. it but okay. it didn't happen and uh, therefore the blame on how the gaudiya math could not carry the movement forward was based on this one wish which is guru maharaj expressed but somehow it did things didn't happen so he said let me not make the same mistake again that wait for a very long time to establish it hmm beautiful so that means okay so if if we consider in the tradition there was the system of mathadipadi and the mathacharya or uh, the matha so the one one leader one acharya organize uh, uh, points a successor acharya so prabhupad did not necessarily institutionalize that system and so the idea is that the more important than more important than replicating the system is is fulfilling the purpose that the system was serving so prabhupad recognized that he had many dedicated disciples and uh, they all could work and they all could contribute but putting them in a hierarchical structure with one head would could it it could lead to even if it doesn't lead to that person becoming too autocratic it could lead to other people feeling a little repressed prabhupad in one sense uh, i read one beautiful offering by uh, one of prabhupad's uh, followers he said that what was how did prabhupad establish such a big movement with with the people who were not very trained so he said that love trust empowerment and forgiveness oh wonderful <laughs> so that is a very radical way of looking at it but prabhupad he he loved he trust and trust means not just verbally but he empowered them and they mis- made mistakes he forgave them so in one sense the governing body commission is a system where prabhupad offered this love trust empowerment not just to one person but to a group of leaders and one of shri prabhupad disciple said that you know why did prabhupad choose these when he had 11 11 particular leaders who made his successor gurus or since prabhupad was not playing favorites prabhupad simply observed at that time who were the most dedicated people so prabhupada appointed them so in that sense prabhupad was prabhupada's decisions were guided by by his purpose and his purpose was to share spiritual culture spiritual wisdom and whoever was helping him most responsibly he offered it to them so that There way is the old sanskrit subhashit that a creeper takes it coils around the nearest tree beautiful so so that's how a king even he has to do something he just finds out who is the person most available right now so we can use this logic that at that time these people and proper actually said later there will be more yes this is another he said later there will be more so he just accepted and you are right when you say that he just saw the dedication who can do it right now they are fresh let me offer them an opportunity that's all so this is a part i like to conclude with this last thought then You know, a creeper goes to the nearest tree or the that branch. It is a creeper when it no, starts. No, what are the things? The creeper goes to the nearest branch or tree. No, it it clings to the nearest tree, which is clings the to the nearest to tree. Grow, right? Yeah. So, so the now my point is that grow, yeah, just to take the example, you know, our focus is primarily to grow the creeper. Now, if we start constructing a tree so that the creeper will grow, exactly. we are going way out of our exactly. our area exactly. of focus. So you know to. to organize society organize economy organize politics it's a gargantuan task and unless somebody is trained dedicated immersed in 
that kind of expertise so we can we can find whatever tree is closest to the creeper and use that and we could say that explains how prabhupad when he got the opportunity to engage with social leaders political leaders he engaged with them as much as he could and he tried to make sure that things move forward so we could do the same in our spiritual setting today exactly so thank you very much for your thank you time and discussion time and thoughts hare krishna